Hello and welcome to Show Love. I'm Bronwyn Murphy. I couldn't let the end of the TV show Big Brother UK go by without a celebration. As I have floor managed it for many years, alongside Davina McCall, Brian Dowling and Emma Willis, I wanted to pay a small tribute and who better to get inside the mind and heart of the show than the man who was always there for the housemates to talk to when they needed an extra bit of care. The resident psychiatrist, Gareth Smith, who has been involved in the selection process and been there for many housemates over the years. And as big fans of the show will have seen, some housemates might have needed an extra bit of love. I'm joined by a lovely and intelligent man today. He has many talents and boy lived a full life. It's the resident for well over a decade TV show Big Brother UK Psych, or as he, he describes himself, Shrink. Welcome, Gareth. Thank you. Hello. Thank you. Um, now, before we get into all the Big Brother thing, uh, the Die Have fans uh, will want me to ask you stuff, which I, I'll, I'll do later. No but um, And we might get in trouble with some of the answers because we both have worked for Big Brother for quite a, a while. But uh, let's go back. Yeah. Life for you started in 1970. It does. Um, if you don't mind me saying that. <laughs> well yeah. I'm 72. No, it course. actually makes me, this, I think you're one of the first that I've done that isn't like a child so oh. it's great um with a presbyterian minister for a father yes please tell us how it all began with that oh wow um well i mean he didn't he didn't start as a presbyterian minister he was a he was a, a well he was a fitter mechanic in um, a cigarette factory in glasgow so i grew up in a council estate um <clears throat> and then when i was about seven i think my dad got a call from god and they gave up his job and decided that he was going to become a minister, which sounds all right, but it was quite a well-paid sort of, you know, blue-collar job he had with a reasonable standard of living, and he went from that to being a student for seven years, um, uh, and that was really tough. Because... So up until you were 14 then? Yeah, 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 up until I was did, did he tell you what... What happened with his call from God, or did he ever explain? No, just God spoke to him, and I just I grew up in a Christian house, so that wasn't unusual for you know for like you know, the answered prayer. Like say, if something bad happened, something good happened, it was answered prayer. If something bad happened, it was self God's will sort of thing, which is really frustrating when you're doing your exams and you pass your exams, <laughs> and your mother goes, "Oh, that's that's answered prayer," and I'm like, "Wow, you know, it's kind of." Studying till four o'clock in the fucking morning yeah, for the last year. I worked half of yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Well, but anyway, I'm sure you've got something to do with it somewhere. But anyway, so no, he was. No, you don't. <laughs> he was. He was a minister. He was a, a, a mechanic, and then he was a student, and that that was the main bit of my childhood that I remember really was was being a student and being so poor um, that the well, the, the grants used to come in. So they used to back in the days when the government paid people to go to college and uni, they um, they would get a grant every term. So this big check would come in. I think it was. I think I even remember. I knew how much it was. Right, that's how like fucked up it was. Um, how much was it? It was four hundred and something pounds. Wow. It wasn't a lot of money. No. And they would fill the freezer with this sort of chest freezer, with a sort of small box chest freezer thing. They would fill it full of meat that they got from a butcher that was frozen. And as the term went on, the freezer would. So you start off at the beginning term with silver side and steak, and then as the term went on, at the bottom of the freezer was two pigs trotters and a heart, <laughs> right? And you're like, so you kind of know. Oh, well, you, you don't ask. Let's hope the term ends like after my birthday, <laughs> or do you know, not Christmas. You know, it's that kind of yeah. yeah. So I always had a paper round, been out, you know, sort of you know, club in to you know, when, when Santa didn't exist. Um, by half my Christmas presents, so that was all clubbed together. And so you were you were giving your money to your parents. Yeah, yeah. Well, yeah, yes, because they didn't have any. And well, I was kind of supposed to get it to myself because I was buying more toys. But it was it was it was it was, it was, it was tough. It was tough for them, I think. Um, but then they went. So then he was a student, and like, so sort of grew up in the church. Um, grew up when I was different. I fancy boys. Um, oh, well, how did how did that come about? How, how do you? Well, how... I didn't. I didn't fancy Princess Leia when yeah. he went to see Star Wars. It was Luke Skywalker. <laughs> yeah, it was yeah. Luke Skywalker. Always. Was that your first crush, was it? Yeah, a little bit. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And how did you deal with that in in your, especially knowing that you know to your parents that you were going to hell? Um, well, yeah. Well, that was that was the thing, and and I mean, it was being mind it was the seventies. Yeah. So like the the only the only gay icons that were on the television were Larry Grayson, 
and no one, no, no one is listening to this will know who they are. Very, very kind. I, I, you I, know who they are. Shut um, that door. Yeah, shut that door. Yeah. Um, the John Inman from, from Are You Being Served. Yes, yeah. Um, Both very, very camp, camp, yeah. Um, and Russell Harty, who was a talk show host, who was also very, very camp. Yes, I, mean, I think he was gay, right? funnily enough. Right, right. okay. Right. Um, so, uh, who's the one that got smacked by Grace Jones? That was, most that famously, that, yeah. That was yeah. Harty. Um, so... And I remember, I still remember, my dad's from the Isle of Lewis, which is sort of a Western Isle, so we're, like, the, we're, 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 like the, the armpit of Scotland. Um, and You've sorry, got a great accent. Sorry, though, sorry, sorry to anyone who lives, who lives up there. <laughs> but, um, I mean, it's just the day that it's not windy is the one day of summer. <laughs> um, and the... Do you, you want me to ask you, how did you, how was it that your parents lived there? How, how... Well, my dad was from there. Right, so they, they so, just yeah, grew so, up yeah, there. So my dad, my dad was from there and there was something sort of, Pulling him back, but he used to speak like that. Hello, I'm your dad. And uh, I remember my ringing thing in my ear was, like, Ugh, queers, yuck. Oh, they should wow. be put in an island and shot, right? Wow. Was what I grew up with. And I was like, well, that's that's me. So, and and my parents were, you know, they, they love God, they love each other, then they love the children. Yeah, that's... And, and that, that was just, that was just it. And I'm not saying my parents don't love me, they absolutely do, but they have a faith. And, yes. and, and I grew up in quite a, religious orientated but I was studying it so there's all these people in the house and and I just knew that I was different so I had to keep the secret and it was you know and I was the perfect I, I was nauseating I was the absolute perfect child is that why do you think that you worked so hard to get into medical school and everything though? yes absolutely. because you wanted them to you, you just you, yeah to to to, to, con- to conform I mean yeah. I did well not to conform but just to, to prove that I was I was, I was worth, worth it yeah yeah absolutely yeah. so I was bright um, I was, you know, my, my I was brighter than my sister, who was older than me. Um, my, then my sister became a Christian, so I was the only one that wasn't a Christian in the house. Um, and so it was, ju- it was just the four of you. Four of us, yeah. yeah. Um, and it was, it, you, so, so you're living with this sort of fundamental core belief that you are wrong, and not only wrong but damned, and and not, and, and it's not. It sounds try for people that aren't religious but when you're a child that's terrifying yeah, and the course. Presbyterian church is proper bible thumping you know believe in God and welcome into you unless you've got Lord Jesus Christ in your heart as your own personal saviour you're not going to go to heaven and I mean I still remember the catechisms that we, we had to learn off by heart and and it was yeah so I so had when the did you realise there was another world out there then because if you brought oh, up oh god them, not until well there's it was case catalog. <laughs> <laughs> oh wow! You the can bring back so many oh, things yeah, from yeah, my yeah, past. The, the under section of case catalog, and it's now led me to my to my. Um, oh, uh, what's oh. that? Well, Car alarm. That's probably, it's probably God. <laughs> <laughs> Your dad. <laughs> Sorry about the car alarm. Here comes here comes a thunderbolt. Um, <laughs> this is my 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 theory. It's my, funny you say that though. Do you still feel a little bit um, not, like that? Not now. No. No, no, no. That's there was, gone, a, there gone. was a real turning point, and that was my grandmother, weirdly, um, much, much later in my life. But um, so all my grandparents were religious as well, so I come from a very religious family. Mm. But but back to the case catalogue. So, case catalogue, <laughs> I think, if you're a gay man and you're, and you're working class, you kind of fancy men in pants. Yeah. Right? Because you get your mum with the case catalogue, and that's where you'd flick to. You'd flick to the pants, yeah. it's your own porn, yeah. and then the toys at the end, right? <laughs> If you're if you're middle class, you fancy men in speedos because the only time you see men undressed is when your dad takes you to the swimming pool to go swimming oh, on a Saturday because they don't have a case catalog. Yeah, of course. So I think that's you got a little, I love a, little how you a little survey. That. Yeah, a little survey amongst people. To, oh, I'm a working class and middle class. What do, I find? do you ask? Yeah. Every time you meet a man. Yeah. So uh, anyway, um, where were we? Apart from the case catalog, so um, the religion. When did I know I was different? I always did. I just had to keep it a secret. Yeah. And and I was bullied terribly at primary school. Gay guy with it, it rhymes. Don't know why. Played with the girls. Uh, did they know? Like did they, I, what, I, mean, I knew all the words to the sound of music when I was four, and that is not an exaggeration. Right, right. I really did. I used yeah. to play it on a loop. Okay. I bought my mum the best hits of Disney album for her <laughs> birthday, right? And used to listen all the songs. I was the camp as camp as Nick is, but I was just so. You're not camp now, though. Well, I think I must. Well, I was, well, I think as a child, it was just like, it was like oh, he's so sweet, yeah. and it was just so nice, and it was like, oh, you've got lovely eyes. I was yeah. that kind Campus of campus knickers. I love it. Yeah, that kind of kid, and then bullied for playing with the girls at school. Obviously, when there was a council scheme in Glasgow, couldn't play. Football. I mean, I still can't kick a football. 
<laughs> a kid kicks a football to me, I still panic. Really? I have to pick it up and throw it back because if I kick it, it goes in completely the wrong direction. You try to be fucking funny, be me, Mister, and I'm like, do I just can't actually kick a ball? So I, was, I literally have to throw it at them. But um, so, so um, yeah, I just, so but my parents still didn't click. Why, why are they calling you gay guys? I don't know. No idea. Just like playing elastics and skipping. I don't know, Mum. Right. Um, so then I sort of suppressed all of that and then went, so then my dad eventually graduated and became a minister and went to the Isle of Lewis to become a minister, which is, for people that would not understand this, a tiny little proportion of people that will understand this, but the best analogy is if my dad was the Pope, it was like moving to the Vatican. Wow. And it was like being the son of a celebrity. Really? It's a tiny little place. It's so steeped in religion. So when I was there, they chained the swings up on a Sunday so kids couldn't play. I mean, and that's not a joke. Wow. In the roundabout and the top of the slide. Um, the, the, you couldn't leave the island on a Sunday because they found everything shut. Um, and everybody either went to church or drank at home. Um, <clears throat> and those they went to church were praying for the ones that were drinking at home. <laughs> and my dad was a minister there. Oh, on this sort of wee free, this sort of real right wing Presbyterian church. Oh, well, so in his mind, mind he he did quite oh, well. Like, well. Yeah, totally. It's like it's like sort of training to be like a football manager and suddenly getting given Arsenal. Yeah, do you know what I mean? Yeah, like I was like, oh, and he was like a celebrity. So you'd walk down the street and every two minutes somebody was like, oh, whatever. Oh, Mister Smith, it's so nice to see you. So then I'm there, thirteen. I sort of moved from we moved from Edinburgh at that point to Tornoway. <laughs> I took wet look hair gel to the Isle of Lewis because they didn't have it. And I was like, you must have wet look hair gel because how, how on earth am I supposed to look like Lamal? Unless I've got oh, wet look. I think I had a crush on Lamal. Unless I've got wet look, you had a crush on Lamal. <laughs> I had a crush on George Michael. I'll tell you George Michael's story. But anyway, so I still don't know how my parents never twigged. But yeah. anyway, so they had to keep. Going. Did you have him on your post? Your no, 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 no. But he, he, he was in Smash Hits and yeah. there was an, an interview with George Michael and it was um, so George's Smash Hits used to ask these stupid questions. Do you pluck your eyebrows? And George went, of course I'll pluck my brows. I'm Greek. I have a monobrow. Uh, if I didn't pluck my brows, you know, it would go a lot to my forehead. I was like, well, if George Michael can pluck his eyebrows <laughs> and he's not gay, I can pluck my eyebrows right. and I come down <laughs> from upstairs with these eyebrows like Greta Garbo. Oh, right? I swear to God, they were so, like <laughs> pencil thin and I've got quite thick eyebrows. These pencil oh, thin, oh. high arched eyebrows and to be fair to my parents, didn't even be the one. Oh, I need to. Oh, like, how have oh, they grown back? I did mine and they never oh, grew back. back. Oh, mine, honestly, they're just they're like weeds. Um, <laughs> so, so then, yeah, the son of a minister in the Isle of Lewis, well, you certainly can't be gay up there. Yeah, but you were kind of exploring. I mean, like, you, no, it wasn't like you weren't doing... No, no, I mean, in the fact that you were, like, plucking your eyebrows, for instance, whereas there'd be other boys that wouldn't... Well, I was just trendy, is yeah. how I viewed it. Because up there, you know, the, this was sort of 1984, we yeah. moved to, to Stornoway. And, you know, when wet look hair gel and you know, Duran Duran yeah, and all new romantics Duran and Duran all of that kind of stuff were in, mm. um, they were still wearing Metallica T-shirts when they weren't yeah. cool snow wash denims and white high tech shoes and that was it and yeah. leather, leather biker jackets and everybody wore that as a uniform so they were like about so many years behind so I was like quite cool and trendy so it wasn't yeah. that I was camp or gay or anything because I certainly wasn't I sort of worked and being a bit bitch and sort of dropping the voice down a wee bit yeah. um, Was that when Boy George was around? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah so then who's gay? Boy George so I studied so hard to try and get into university and got in to uni at 16 <laughs> So I went to medical school in Aberdeen. I turned 17 in Freshers' Week. Um, I mean, that's unheard of, isn't it? It's like, well, it was, it, was, it was doable. It's not doable now. It was, at the time, it was sort of just about doable. You must have been bloody clever. Well, no, I think it was just young for my year. Yeah. And, it, and they just took people from that year. And I did a good interview. So yeah, how yeah, are you putting yourself down, and, um, Doc? <laughs> and, but I wasn't ready for university. No. And, and not... I wasn't ready socially. Had you had any um, gay experiences? Yeah, by none the, at all. Nothing. Nothing. No, no. Was there? I was at like, free for the first time away yeah. from my parents, away from anyone, um, and I was like, I think I might be gay. I think I might be gay. I think I might be gay. I need to do something about this. So I phoned up the gay switchboard, and that would, there used to be such a thing. Yeah. And there used to be a time when they were like, "I'll meet you for a coffee." Said so the guy that was speaking to. Was it like, fine? Great. Okay, cool. So we met this guy for coffee who was lovely. It was a bit ominous meeting a guy for coffee. When yeah, you would think it. nowadays you would think so. Yeah. Then it was actually innocent and in yeah. a way that wasn't in any way creepy. And he, it, and he helped you. He really wasn't. And he was like, do you know what? There's one gay bar in Aberdeen. <laughs> um, 
there's a lot of people that go there. One guy in particular, he just he always goes for the what you would call twinks now, but they used to be called chickens back then. He always goes for the for the for the twinks. Um, he'll he'll go after you. At that point, it was seventeen. It was illegal to have sex. You couldn't have sex until you were twenty-one, Ricky, back in nineteen eighty-six. Okay. Um, and I, I was convinced if anyone found out I was gay, I would get thrown out of medical school, yeah. and my parents wouldn't talk to me, and I would go to you know every my life would just end, so yeah. no one could know. So I just I get false names, said it was on a different course. I was like, "What's the name of that bar that you said I shouldn't go to?" And I was like, oh, "Just call it, I don't know, Chariot's Bar." Or it wasn't even called that. <laughs> Chariot's Bar, oh, right? I love it. And uh, and I was like. Okay, yeah, okay, no, no, I definitely won't go. He said, no, so if you're going to go, phone me and I will take you out. I'm not hitting on you, I've got a boyfriend, I'll take you out with my friends and, and introduce you to people, but don't go on your own because this guy will pick you up and he's going to creep. And I was like, okay, thank right, you. Cool. What did I do the next night? Went straight to the bar <laughs> on my own. Oh, not with but that guy, you think? I got with the guy who <laughs> was an absolute creep. Oh. Um, it was horrible. Uh, was he horrible to you? Well, no, he wasn't horrible, he was just really, he was just a bit. In the hindsight, really quite creepy. He must have been in his thirties. I was seventeen. Yeah. He was a bit sleazy. I'm sure he was probably videoing things back in the days when you had these big Betamax cameras. It was. I caught my first STI oh, at wow. seventeen, and it was horrific. Yeah. And I was in trauma. Um, and but you were probably so dying to just try something. I was, but it was awful. It was an awful experience. Yeah. And my my ex girlfriend's friend was the year above me and in medical school we used to pair you with a student the year above you and I was paired with, with her um, and we I told her so I was like you don't guess what's happening I got this I had to go to the doctor blah, 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 blah. it's awful and I'm gay my parents are, are religious and they've been thrown out the house and she was like oh don't worry about it doing so it's, it's awful it's, yeah. it's, it's come you know you can and I, didn't, I was so socially inept I was 17 I everyone was older than me they'd all been I'd never been I'd never got drunk never touched a dr- drop of alcohol so I went to university right I was that good such a good kid a proper proper good kid like nauseating but so depressed with all this yeah, anger. Yeah. Um, and so I started hanging around with, with Mel and her friends um, and she sort of took me under a wing and I got into that set and it, everything seemed fine. And then Mel's friend was coming through from from her school, from her village. She lived not far from my parents in Inverness. was coming through. He was really posh. He went to Fetters College and thought he was posh. And I was kind of seduced because I came from a council house. And I was seduced by this real middle class um, lifestyle. I mean, I was always told, order the cheapest thing in the menu, son. That's it. Because yeah. we never had any money. Yeah. Um, and they were all sort of swanning around with their Bennett and jumpers over their shoulders and their fucking hunter wellies and all that shit, right? <laughs> and I was like, oh, the thing even. <laughs> um, and Barry came through. You know, being gay was bad. Yeah. Not have also done that. Well, let's, let's do this. And we... <laughs> Ends up proposing one day, um, and then she it's said amazing yes. Amazing what you do when you feel like. I know she said yes, and then we told the parents, and then before you knew it, we were get married. Oh, wow. Because actually, I mean, we can skip through a whole load of weddings and marriages and and and, and stuff, um, and yeah, it, it, to the fact that actually, when my parents did find out, they're absolutely fine with it, oh, and they're fine with it now. It's awful that that you went through all. Yeah, that. because I believed because I was so I think because I was so secretive, and so I felt so guilty and and internalized everything. I actually fundamentally believed that they wouldn't love me, yeah. and I fundamentally believed that they wouldn't that 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 I would be on my own and I didn't know how to be on my own. Despite that, I had been on my own since I was fifteen, so yeah. I looked after myself really. Um, but there might be people listening now that are in exactly the same place, sort of like yeah. Uh, so demonising what could Demonize, happen yeah, de- 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 yeah thinking the worst case scenario and you know even when and the worst case scenario has happened I mean it's to me and, and and that you know I mean it was it was not an easy divorce and I started doing psychiatry because I really hated medicine I mean all the way through medical school I absolutely hated it and didn't know why I was doing it and it was, but anyway did it because I needed to finish it but it's, no, it's fascinating there's so much I could ask you about how you know you get into people's brains and mm. and and I mean you must have seen so many things. Oh God, yeah. Like you said earlier that um, you know you've had people in tears every day <laughs> in your office. And yeah, yeah, yeah. You worked for the NHS, then you worked for Big Brother. Worked for Big Brother. Worked for so how, did, how did the Big Brother job come about? It came about because I had uh, I was asked by one of our 
trendy middle class friends who happen to be a television editor for Taggart to Taggart. Uh, to Taggart to Taggart has been a murder <laughs> with a purple burglar alarm. <laughs> um, so we did this. We we did we, did, we did, wrote an article for the Sunday Herald, um, which is a broadsheet in, in Scotland that all the you know, all the middle class people read. And it was a questionnaire that we came up with of how, how do you know your children are happy, right? And I had always been, I wanted to write. Um, I was always much better at English at school. So we came up with this thing and it, it did really well. People really liked it and got really good feedback. And then off the back of that, the, the Sunday Mail, not the Mail on Sunday, can I just be frank, the Sunday Mail, which is the Sunday equivalent of the Daily Record, which is a mirror group of newspapers, was Scotland's biggest Sunday. But the Daily Record is like the sun in Scotland. It's like a big, big it's the daily paper. The Sunday Mail doctor was retiring and they were looking for another doctor to do a medical column. So I, a friend of mine, recommended to me and I went in and met with the editor who then became one of my very bestest friends. And what, um, year, what year was this? Oh God, this was 2000 maybe. Right. Um, and I got the job and it was like, dear doctor, I've got hemorrhoids, I don't know what to do with them, what should I do? And I was like, Amazing. fill the glove up with water, put it in the freezer and sit on it. Um, you know, it was, that, it was that kind of thing. So every week for about, I mean, I did it, must have done it for about 10 or 12 years. Wow. As a Sunday meal doctor, right? And because it was a Sunday meal doctor, I used to get asked on to sort of BBC Radio Scotland morning programmes to talk about the latest thing for shyness or what causes blushing and all that usual little mini segment of bullshit it, yeah. where you, you're not allowed to be funnier than the host oh, um, God, yeah. so I, I would go and I thought I could do a wee bit of radio I think I've got an alright voice for radio I and I love Frasier I was like hmm Glasgow if you're about schizophrenic tonight phone Dr G it's Dr G spot you can phone me anytime you want I give you pleasure right I thought I could do that would be great so I'll get an agent I've done a wee bit of Amdram right so clearly like showing off um, so I got, got, uh, got an agent, she took me on, uh, didn't get any work at all, no radio whatsoever, but then she sent my biog off, or my CV, let's call it a biog, and show with, sent my CV off to Big Brother, who, who used to do a psychology show on a Sunday night, there was little segments that get put into the reality, like little three minute slots, with like people talking about micro gestures of twitching housemates and you know, what was happening in group dynamics. And I got the gig and I was like, you're fucking dancing. I'm like, I love Big Brother. I'm on Big Brother. This is amazing. I'm on the telly. I never thought I'd ever be on the telly. And then, because there's not that many people, or there wasn't, there's millions of them now, but back in the day, in the day there wasn't that many people in my line of work who went on telly. I then got asked to be a talking head on like 101 Bizarre Sexual Accidents. Right, you yeah. know, uh, or, we love those programs. Oh yeah, yeah. Or the, the best one was The Girl's Guide to 21st Century Sex. You can still get it on YouTube, folks. Brilliant. Watch me talking about premature ejaculation, <laughs> um, looking all doctory, whilst the overlay is a man furiously wanking. Oh yeah, my goodness. But, yeah, yeah, because you could, um, you could show erections and sort of porn as long as it's doctors that are presenting really? it. Really? Yeah, it's a broadcasting room. You've got like so yeah. much of a future now. With oh that. God, yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. So yeah, so I did bits of that and then... Um, so this was in 2000? This was in... So it's, uh, this was, I started the paper in 2000 and this was in 2003. Right. And then, so I did a couple of... I did Big Brother 4, what no one speaks of. Yeah. Um, and then... Yeah, because 2005 is... Is, is the, Nadia. Yes. Year, right? So yeah. that, that, that year I did a bit more, but then fight night happened. So um, I thought I'm not doing this anymore. Unless I'm involved in picking the people that are going in, I'm not taking responsibility for them. Yeah. So I took two years off. I took the next year, which is the, the two best years of Big Brother, assuming yeah. And then I came back the one after. Right. Because what happened was um, one of the housemates uh, had a very tough time in Nicky Graham's year and left very early and needed support yeah. um, when they went home. And I gave that, so because I'd worked on the show, I knew the producers, I phoned them and said, would you like me to see this person? And they said, yes, that would be really helpful. Oh, that's good. Um, and I gave, you know, offered support, helped them through a difficult time. Can you not say that? I wouldn't mind, no, that's not no. fair, really. Um, and, oh, I mean, they would take me if I yeah, hadn't asked. Yeah, I know. But, um, <laughs> and, 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 you know, just kind of... Because Big Brother can be quite dramatic. Oh, yeah. It's like people people relive their childhoods and yeah. their playground experiences in the house, yeah. often. And, and I mean, obviously, the, 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 my, my theory on it might be wrong. It's no, it doesn't come from a textbook. But it's like, there are 
Do you want to talk about Big Brother? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, so is that as long as you don't get us in trouble. No, no, no. <laughs> but I think you know, there's, there's like three main stages in, in your development. The Big Brother takes the role of ultimate parent. It controls the environment. It controls how hot and cold, what you eat, when you yeah. sleep, when you wake, all of these kind of things. Last time that happened to you, you were a child. Yeah, absolutely. Right? So you, and when you were a child, the two sort of important stages of sort of social interaction are when you're in primary school and you're running around that like a, like a like an idiot. Excuse yeah. my my phone. Um, that's or it's God, or it's actually probably Big Brother saying shut the fuck up. Um, <laughs> and the um, so yeah, they run around and act like a kid. Yeah. So are, we, are we taking too much time? No, no. Or you're an adolescent where you're going. Oh, look at this day of her sitting over there talking about. Oh, look at her mess of her. Right. There's yeah. that. Or you're a grown up because they're all grown ups and they're going. Oh God. So the kids running around going, ah, look at me, what to fight you, let's get naked. The adolescents are sitting going, <laughs> hate kids, and look at them, stuffy ones sitting over there drinking the tea, and the adults are going, on. Oh, look at both of them. But everybody moves through these stages at different times. Right. So it's not, you're not stuck in one of them in Big Brother, you kind of move through them all the time at different phases, and that's where the conflict arises, and that's why the groups form, and that's why there's lots of childish behaviour and lots of backbiting and bitching because it is literally like being a child again. Yeah. But then the dawning comes on you that you're not a child, you're a grown-up. And then you think, fuck, and then before you know it, you're a child again. Um, this must be fascinating for you to... I mean, it's fascinating for us to watch, but for you knowing that this is what It is. It's, it make, do you know what? It makes it easier when it comes to um, helping the housemates. And my job... Um, is to be supportive. Well, my job is to make sure the wrong people don't end up in the house. Yes. Um, not. So you're not. You have been involved in that now in the. In the in the selection process. The selection process, yeah. and then you. And, are then, there and then when I moved support. when I moved to Channel Five, I then moved from I gave up my NHS job and moved down to London, and then looked after them. The sort of ongoing through care, which <clears throat> is from sort of selection to six months after the, the after the finale. So um, the, what, talk us through the selection process. How does that work? Well, there's, there's, I mean, there's, you've got to impress a lot of producers. Um, you've got to be um, sassy and, and sharp in a diary room. You've got to be different without the pretend, without pretending to be different. So just something about you, and it's, it's you, you basically you just be yourself. Yeah. And either you're going to be a good housemate, which. No offence to all the housemates out there, and I, I like many of them. That's not always a compliment. Mm. Someone saying, you would be a great big brother housemate. Yeah, Sometimes yeah. it's a bit of an insult. Yeah. Um, so you, you either have to be... A, 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 there's got to be something about you that makes you stand out from the crowd, and that's not wearing a fucking thong or getting your dick out. That's not going to bode well when you put them in a house where every single person nowadays, especially in the country, can see whatever the fuck they want directly to yes, them via yeah. Twitter and Instagram. It's a scary place And to it's, it it's, it's a horrible, horrible... It, it brings out the vilest parts of people's personalities, yeah. twi um, Twitter. Yeah. And, and the thing is, is because I know the housemates... Granted, I wouldn't want to sit in a restaurant with all of them and yeah. have dinner, right? I wouldn't, and I, I, that, but that's just my personality. But actually, they are all people, they've all had lives, they've all, most of them have been through difficulties, and do you know what? Something fucking good about them enough to be on the telly. Yeah, you, know? you must get quite attached to some of them, yeah. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, I get attached to them. <laughs> I said to the mom, well, my children, I just love you differently. <laughs> um, you know, you have no favourites. There's, there's some that you get there's some, to see. Think, when the shit hits the fan, you, you go and see them, right? Well, yeah, so, 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 no, so when, when, when they're in the house, if the shit hits the fan and they're not, Big Brother can't sort it out. Some, I am the only person that will speak to the housemates off camera as, as me. Um, usually because I'll, I'll swear. Face to face? No, some, mm, rarely. It's yeah. usually through the diary room. Yeah. But I'll be like, oh, Bronwyn, come on, what the fuck? Yeah. What are you doing? Why are you crying all the time? Yeah. Right? And I can see, and it's, it's the, the, when you're locked in that little place, you lose perspective. You could be on the moon. And having a voice of someone that's not big brother speaking in the third person about themselves, and you're suddenly going, oh, come on. I'm just going to nick over to the shops and get a sandwich. Are you hungry? Because you're on basic rations. <laughs> I'll, I'll think about you when I'm eating it. And I can make them laugh. And I normalise it. And yeah. it's not that I work some special magic. I don't. Mm. But I am just can be that point of difference. And it, I mean, I certainly do not speak to all housemates at all times. I don't. No. You know, we let them try and sort their stuff out in the house. But sometimes people just get to a point where it's th 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 they're not coping or they yeah. seem distressed or 
you know, they're really isolated or, or you know, they, they seem to be getting picked on or they seem to be picking on other people. And and my my motto is always, it's only a fucking television show mm. and don't let what happens in a stupid Ikea, locked inside Ikea, don't let that actually affect your actual life. Do you say that to them? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Don't let it affect your real life. Mm. If something's happening in there that's going to go out and fuck with your real life, you need to get some perspective on it. Yeah. But generally, you know... When, certainly when you're putting people who are not born and bred in showbiz, they're not Ant and Deck that have grown up in, in the showbiz world and are therefore, you know, finely know groomed to, do, yeah. to, to know what to say and what TV not to trains, say. TV trains. TV trains, yeah, yeah, yeah. You're putting actual people from, you know, working Burger King or, you know, just norm, normal, proper, common garden working class folk that I grew up with. People have colloquialisms. People do. There is casual racism. Yeah. Um, it doesn't mean that, that that is necessarily vindictive, but granted, the rule is, if you do something in the house that offends your housemates, nobody really gives a shit. Bear, for example, if you remember him. Yeah. Um, Stephen Bear. He annoyed the hell out of all these people. Yeah. He stole their food, he threw their coffee on the floor, he did whatever he wanted. Right? If that was in your actual house, you'd call the police. Yeah. Right? It's a big brother house. It's entertainment. I think it's really funny watching James Whale get really upset about the fact that somebody poured coffee on his head. That's funny. However, Christopher Biggins got removed for upsetting bisexual people. Um, Because if you upset someone in their actual home, that's a problem. Mm. If you upset someone in the big brother house, that's not a problem. So that's that's the real sort of upside down, topsy turvy world of, of, of big brother. And that can be really difficult. The difference between celebrity Big Brother and civilian Big Brother is that in civilian Big Brother you're taking what, what in the health service we used to call an unknown quantity, right? So you're taking someone that you don't know, you know nothing about, you have to do your research, do your due diligence and speak to the families, do home visits, do you know multiple investigations, get medical records, all of that kind of stuff to find out a picture of who this housemate is, right, for the civilian one. Celebrities are paid to do a job, mm, right, yeah. which is to go on to an ent- yeah. a factual entertainment show and be locked locked inside IKEA for money. It's like IKEA. It's like IKEA. It it is. Is like it's literally like an IKEA. It's like like IKEA where you can't get out. Yeah. So it's like yeah. Nightmare. Um, and I've been lost in IKEA once. That's oh, no, horrible. It's horrible. Since yeah. you go the wrong way around yeah. the end of the arrow. Yeah. Like, ah! So it must actually. I mean, like you. Mm. I, and I was have stood in and been in Big Brother for less than an hour and forgotten oh, that I had a microphone. Yep. Like so, I completely mm. get. How I took a they... person. I took a person in the toilet and because I was waiting to see there. I used to go in the last day to speak to the housemates just because it was easier because it's finale and there's no time. <laughs> and I went into the, the small task room toilet and was quite happily having a person looking in the mirror. I was like, oh fuck, there's a camera. <laughs> So, so you do totally forget, yeah, totally yeah. forget, totally forget. Um, so no, the it, the question with celebrity big brother is, are you fit to work? Yeah, okay. Right. And the difference between being fit to work and not fit to work, well, that's that's a different threshold from yeah. are you fit to be a reality TV star? Yeah, right. Because these people are already working, despite the fact that everyone thinks that you know they're, they're all evil Machiavellian bastards out there. I mean, one or two are, but most people that yeah. work that I've come across that I work with aren't. Otherwise, I wouldn't do it because I come from a from a healthcare background where my job is to get people better yeah i don't i don't want to hurt people no you take a, you take an oath of do no harm yeah um, i'm not going to set someone up it's a really positive way of looking at yeah, it and, and, and i would I, you know i always say to, always say to all of the housemates is i will tell you the truth yeah i promise you i'll tell you the truth i think if i think you're being an idiot for, and i bet you've said out, that quite uh-huh. a lot of times i think you're being an idiot for walking out because you're getting upset about an oxo cube yeah i can tell you you're being an idiot <laughs> If I think you're not being an idiot and this is actually doing you more harm than good, I will take you out of the door. Yeah. Which we've done. You so. are much needed. Well. Yeah. And and I, I put it out there to um, people. I don't know how long this has gone on for. Oh, so yeah. You've got to leave soon. Okay. Um, I put it out there for some okay. uh, people to ask you questions oh, on Twitter. Ah. Uh, the dark place that is. Um, uh, it's, it's only a few. Mm. Okay, but um, for the first one, uh, Liz um, Conmatoli asked, when is Big Brother coming back? <laughs> oh, well, given that I've just dropped two thirds of my salary, I'm kind of hoping it comes back in the summer. Yeah. Or maybe January. You January. Both, but I don't think it is. Yeah, yeah, it? yeah. January would be handy. Like if you just do a wee celebrity one and just say it was all yeah. a big joke. We, we actually don't know. It's Absolutely don't know if it's coming back, yeah. and that and that is the God's honest truth. And we're um, gutted, really, as are yeah, it, the other four hundred plus people. Yeah, that yeah. It's been it's a big because the thing is it's a big part of your of your life. And granted, it is only a television show, but it's not that. It is the people you work with. Yeah. And the friendships. We're family. Yeah, and it's 
and like family you squabble and people you like and people you don't like but it's actually it's a nice sh- and it's a, do you know what I've got quite good at it and yeah. I'm sure you've got quite good at it over yeah, the years yeah. and you get it's quite good doing a job that you think you're quite good at mm. um, and to suddenly have to go out and tout for business now, oh you'll seems... get snapped up <laughs> but like that oh. um, so Sophie uh, B6849071 the most random uh, Twitter uh, <laughs> or whatever that is uh, why did Cameron mash his sausages Cameron the winner of 2018 because he can't cook because um, cause he uh, <laughs> he thought that you had to you know, like, like you know, his mum clearly not told him how to cook a sausage, to cook a link sausage. Because we do different types of sausage in Scotland. You've got you've got sliced sausage and you've got links. <laughs> sliced sausage just looks like what Cameron did, so I would have eaten it to be frank. But um, he thought that you had to slit a sausage in half to make it work, so he slit it and then it all burst open, and then he just tried to sort of mash it up to cook it because. Frankly, he needs some cooking lessons. Yeah, bless Cameron coming out uh, on the show, yes. which is yes. a big deal. Kind of yeah. part of you maybe wishes that you had the courage to do that. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And 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 I said that to him. Um, it took me till I was twenty-seven to publicly come out. But isn't that fascinating? That all of that stuff you just said, the the winner of the last yeah. series, all of your experience, yeah. you were there for him. Absolutely, to do and, and 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 and. Amazing, and if one message to take on to people is don't be scared and be thank, not be thankful. It, it's it's a difficult world to grow up in nowadays mm. with with Instagram and Twitter and and Facebook and social media and and narcissism and selfies. But you've got role models out there who there's gay people on Doctor Who. Fuck me, there was nothing gay on the television yeah. when I was younger. Yeah. There's people that you can look up to and think, well, actually, you can. I actually didn't believe I could be a doctor and be gay. Wow. Didn't believe it. Um, I and now I, you are living that dream. And now, and now <laughs> <laughs> you know, me. Um, so, yeah, folks, Cameron's a brilliant example. Talking about the last one, at Nick Bateman one. Ah. How <laughs> did you get it so wrong, he wrote. <laughs> I don't I, think that's directly I think a, a, aimed at you. I, but, do you know uh, what? I didn't, I, didn't, <laughs> I didn't sign Nick Bateman. That was Big Brother 1. I yeah. was a fan at that point I started watching it when that happened I know oh, exactly right yeah. we all did yeah. it was fascinating thanks uh, Nasty Nick for your tweet thank you Gareth for being so open still never uh, said about what your nan did just quickly tell me do you know what she told me that I went to see her mum I'd been, I, I was told not to really talk to her because she was old and not tell her I was gay right because I was upset and I went to see her I hadn't seen her for about three years as a result and she was in a head on she wasn't very well I went to see her and I explained to her what had happened and I said, fundamentally, I think I'm probably going to go to hell, like, according to what the beliefs are. And she said, do you live your life well, son? And I was like, yeah. And said, do you try and do good things with people? And I went, yes, I do. And I said, well, that's how Christ lived his life. So, of course, you're a Christian. Oh. And for me, whilst I don't believe necessarily in, in, in everything that, you know, the, like, all the bad kind of stuff, and I'm not going into religious talk, but for me, that was the one bit of validation that was like, okay, all right, okay, so it's not, I'm not fundamentally evil to my core. And that changed me massively. Oh, I that's Just keep talking, tell tell your nan, will, tell yeah. everyone. That's the way to live, right? Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. If find someone, confide in them, and and just actually, do you know what? I say, I say, what I say to housemates, and if any of them are listening to this, they'll know, is that some people are cats and some people are dogs. Dogs don't like cats and cats don't like dogs. Now, there's nothing wrong with cats or dogs. They're just different from one another, right? A cat will get on with a dog if it's grown up, if it grows up with it, but they're fundamentally just different. The worst thing you can ever be is a barking cat, right? Which is a cat pretending to be a dog because the dogs will look at you, they'll know you're a cat and go, what the fuck is that cat barking at? And the cats will go, why is it barking? Does it not like us? And you're on your own. Wow. And for a long time, I was a barking cat. So. Folks, don't be a barking cat. Be the best cat you can be and the best dog you can be and just accept that you're different from other people. I love that. What a great way of ending it. (laughs) Thank you so much. You're very welcome, Bonnie. Gareth, please leave the big brother house. Thank you so much, Gareth, for sharing your story and encouraging people to be themselves. Be true to who you are, even if you think it's different to everyone else. That's it for now. Love you for listening, and don't forget to show love. Thank you to Ollie Trevers and Danny Wright for their great music. Thank you to Alex McArdle for sound. Please follow us on Facebook, Show Love UK, 
or Show Love Podcast, and Twitter and Instagram at Show Love UK. The blinds and the sunlight burns my eyes. Here we go with another daily grind. So much to get through. I know I'll start it. Self-stimulation, instant gratification I'm self-medicating, therapist recommending More meditating, wasted education I need more admiration And I, I don't wanna bother with today I pretty much missed it anyway Might as well stay Stadium in my name, carbon pavement.